Good afternoon and welcome to the third session of the inaugural um, symposium hosted by the Clinic for Asylum, Refugee and Immigrant Services uh, here at the Villanova University of Charles Woodruff School of Law. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. My name is Christopher Midway and I'm a student at the CARES Clinic and organizer of this panel, uh, Introduction to Immigration Detention. Before we begin, I have a few quick announcements. If you have any questions at all during the program, uh, if you look down below or on the right, there's a Q&A function that you can ask us anything you have. Um, we'll get to as many questions as we can at the end of the program. And we are providing one free Pennsylvania CLE credit for this panel, thanks to a generous gift from our donor, Joseph Azarok. If you are seeking that CLE credit for this program, you will need to fill out a course eval at the end of the, of the program. It'll be sent out via email. And in throughout the course, you'll hear two secret words. Those two secret words are your key to getting your credit for free. Um, without two, those two secret words, you will not get the CLE credit. If you're coming from out of state, we can provide you a certificate that you've attended this and that should be carried over. During the course of this panel, we will have a very talented artist masterfully create a sketch of the content being articulated to illustrate the skills and information of the panel. Lastly, we have a resources page with links relevant uh, with related articles, sources, and uh, law review articles uh, related to the topic of the panel, and that'll be in the email as well. At this point, I'm going to turn it over to Professor Michelle Pistone, founder of the CARES Clinic here at Villanova University and professor of law, to moderate and introduce the panelists. Hi, everyone. I'm Michelle Pistone, and I'm so delighted to pull to get to be able to moderate this panel. We have a great group of speakers on an important topic, one of the most important topics in immigration, immigration detention. It was actually the topic that I wrote my first law review article on. So it's something that I care deeply about and we have a great group of people to talk about it. So um, I'm gonna start by posting a question to the panelists and have them introduce themselves in the context of this question. So the question is, why should we care about the issue of immigration detention? So Tony Vale will be the first person to respond to that. Tony, introduce yourself and answer the question. Thank you very much, Professor. Um, uh, as you said, my name is Tony Vale. I uh, originally came from England, but I practiced uh, here at Pepper Hamilton, and now it's called Troutman Pepper, for uh, over 40 years in litigation. Uh, but for what you might call an encore, I've been doing immigration work for the last uh, four or five years and have really enjoyed it. And uh, there's no question that detention is really important. And, and I didn't understand it when I first got, got involved with this, but there are so many people who are arrested by ICE and end up in York prison or somewhere like that. And their life is totally disrupted. They're, they're plucked uh, from their families, from their work, um, with no advance notice, obviously. And they're stuck in the prison with limited ability to communicate uh, with their attorneys. And so getting them out of detention is enormously important, not just for their family life, their social life, possibly their working life, but it's also tremendously important to allow them to work with, with lawyers and others uh, who may be assisting them. By that, I'm thinking of the Nationality Service Center or HIAS or, or other refugee immigrant groups, <clears throat> but it allows them to work much more closely with their advisors uh, to prepare a defense to removal. Great, thank you, Tony. And next I wanna ask Rebecca Hofstetter to introduce herself and tell us why this topic is important for lawyers <clears throat> to know about. Thank you, thank Michelle. You. Uh, my name's Rebecca Hofstetter. I am a staff attorney at Nationality Service Center and I'm also the immigration specialist at the Defender Association of Philadelphia. Um, so, I wear a few different hats, but before my current role, I exclusively represented detained folks um, in immigration detention who hail from the Philadelphia area. Um, and, you know, I endorse everything that Tony said, but I would add that this area of the law is really where we see the intersection of, 
you know, our nation's racist immigration policy with racist policing and mass incarceration policies um, and the prison industrial complex kind of all coming together. Folks who may or may not have gotten caught up in the criminal justice system and then are funneled into the immigration system and detained sometimes for very long periods of time um, in ways that profit counties and private prisons and make it extraordinarily difficult for them to litigate their immigration cases and just continue doing the things that they need to do in their lives, supporting their families um, emotionally or financially, as Tony was describing. So, um, and there are things that you can do to get people out of detention. So that's why it's great for lawyers to learn about this so they can help us in that struggle. And our third panelist is Jenny Chow. And so Jenny, tell us about your work um, working on immigration detention. Sure, hi everyone. My name is Jenny Zhao. I'm a staff attorney with Asian Americans Advancing Justice Asian Law Caucus. I'm not in Pennsylvania, I'm in California representing the West Coast out here. Uh, we do a combination of removal defense in immigration court and we also do federal court litigation on behalf of detained folks. Um, and I think I wasn't prepared to answer this question and I you know, fully agree with everything that Tony and Rebecca said. And um, I would just add that I, I really believe that mass incarceration um, writ large, which includes immigration detention is one of the most pressing human rights issues of our time. And I, I think the immigration detention system, just like criminal incarceration reflects this country's obsession with locking people up as a way to solve all sorts of different types of problems that aren't addressed at all through, um, through incarceration. So I think I'm really glad to have everyone here today. So that was great. Thanks for those introductions and um, words of encouragement that we want to get lawyers involved in this work because it's so important and so needed. So we have a PowerPoint that we're going to walk through um, and then we'll have Q&A at the end. If anyone has questions as you hear the panelists, please um, include them in the Q&A and I'll be monitoring them and we'll um, have a discussion toward the end. So we're going to start by thinking about who's in immigration detention and then have a little bit about the legal framework that and the, the statutes that um, that allow for detention and then talk at the end about how you can get involved and then we'll have some Q&A. So let me turn it over to the panelists for the first slide. Okay, thanks Michelle, I'm gonna kick it off. Um, so we just wanted to start very broad and give a general sense of how people come to be in immigration detention. Um, so I think at the most basic level, it's important to understand that immigration detention is civil detention officially, although it looks identical to criminal incarceration. Often people are detained in jails alongside people who are either serving time for or waiting trial on criminal charges. But it is civil detention, and that means it's not supposed to be a punishment for having done anything wrong. It's more akin to, in the criminal context, what we would think of as pretrial detention. It, you're in immigration detention because you're waiting for something to happen. You're waiting for a hearing on your deportation case, or you're waiting um, to maybe be deported. And that can take a very long time, and we're going to get into that, but just to understand that at a basic level. Um, and, and so there are people in immigration detention who fit into a few different categories and we're going to kind of slice and dice that group a few different ways. Um, but just to get a sense how folks end up there. Um, so one category are uh, people who we are called under the statute arriving aliens. Um, we don't use the word alien unless we're quoting the statute, but sometimes when we're quoting the statute, we use that term. Um, and the, those are people who are coming from outside the United States, have typically presented themselves, either they flew into an airport or they um, more often are presenting themselves like at the southern border. You may have seen this on the news. Often they are asking for asylum and they can be detained at that point and transferred anywhere else in the country. Um, we have folks who are transferred up to Pennsylvania, to New Jersey, who never had any intention of coming to Pennsylvania or New Jersey, but were detained at the southern border and then transferred. Um, there are also people who successfully cross the border but are detained just after that. Um, they're legally in a different situation, but sort of 
their lives look very similar to the first category. They're people who have just gone here and are, and are trying to apply for asylum. Um, then there are folks who are, have been here for a while, um, but are out of status in some way. Um, so maybe they entered with the, with, without inspection, they crossed the border at some point in the past, maybe they came on a visa, um, but the visa has expired or they've fallen out of status. And those people are subject to deportation just because of their lack of status. It, it could be that a contact with police and arrest sort of drew ICE's attention to them, but maybe not. Um, they also could have been picked up just because they were in the wrong place at the wrong time. They were near somebody else who ICE was looking for. Um, and so they can also be detained. And then there are folks who um, may be here in lawful status. They might be lawful permanent residents. They might be refugees or asylees, but they have some type of problem that renders them deportable. And often, but not always, that's a criminal conviction. Um, and there is a large range of criminal convictions that can make even people who are here lawfully, lawful permanent residents, subject to deportation as well as to detention. Um, so that's sort of a broad view of all the types of people who can end up in immigration detention. ICE does not have to detain any of these people, even if they want to put them into deportation um, proceedings, we call removal proceedings. Um, ICE makes that initial determination um, and they do release people, but especially in the last four years, um, and especially people who are detained in the interior are often not released at that stage. And then we'll talk about sort of the next level of things that can be done to get them out. Um, Yep, so I'll turn it over to Tony. Yeah, <clears throat> I uh, agree with everything uh, Rebecca said. I, I guess I would just stress one thing that, that struck me uh, when I got involved in this work is the serendipity of it. Um, there, there are a lot of people out there who, as Rebecca said, are out of status, but they are in the wrong place at the wrong time. And, you know, some of these stories really stand out for me. I'll just mention one. Uh, it was a, a guy uh, along with several others, and they were uh, building chicken uh, barns or, you know, facilities out in central pa Pennsylvania for uh, housing chickens. And uh, they were, you know, the guy running the, the job had them in a you know, pretty basic motel and there they were raped and she called the uh, local police at like 6.30 in the morning and said I was raped last evening so the police officers come over and they get all these guys out of their rooms and tell them to sit in the hallway. Well, I mean the rape allegation didn't pan out but the local police decided oh, let's just call our friends over ICE. And then, you know, ICE shows up with 30 pairs of handcuffs and 30 guys are uh, carted off to York prison. And, you know, I, I could probably go through another half dozen examples of sort of serendipitous uh, arrests just, just like that. And I, unless I, I'd be happy to talk about the Fourth Amendment because perhaps some of you might be thinking, well, was that a proper search and seizure? Uh, and the answer is probably not, um, but I, I won't get into that at, at this point, but it's certainly kind of a red flag when you, you get one of these situations is to see whether uh, there's a possible uh, motion to suppress. So before we go to the next slide, Jenny, did you want to add anything? No, okay. Well, uh, let's, let's just go back a slide, Chris. Um, so uh, the, the legal analysis really uh, begins with um, you want to know if you're uh, about to represent somebody who's detained, under what provision of the statute are they detained? And uh, there are several different provisions, and we're going to talk about that, but that's the, the key initial question. And why is it important? Because uh, you want to know if your client is in the vernacular bond eligible. In other words, can they go to an immigration judge and seek uh, release on bond? And unfortunately, there are a lot of non-citizens who get caught up, 
get detained who are not bond eligible. And two major categories are so-called arriving aliens. And that is somebody, as Rebecca explained, who essentially comes to the border um, and uh, doesn't have an entry visa, but says to the uh, immigration officer, I'd like to apply for asylum. Uh, they are an arriving alien and they have no right to a bond hearing. So they are subject to, in other language, uh, mandatory detention. Uh, there's another group of uh, so-called criminal aliens. Um, and it's a very complicated area of the law, but uh, certainly uh, somebody who is picked up by ICE uh, having committed what's known as an aggravated fe felony or something else called a crime involving moral turpitude is not eligible for bond. So um, you, you have to figure it out. Uh, if they're bond eligible, we'll get, get to uh, what do you do about that. If they don't appear to be bond eligible, there is a possibility of uh, sort of seeking a redetermination of the classification of the non-citizen. For example, if he's classified by ICE as a, an arriving alien, but you don't think he is, well, you might be able to challenge that. Um, but uh, we'll get to this uh, a little later, but if you're not bond eligible, you might be wondering, well, does that mean that you just stay in detention essentially indefinitely? And the answer is yes, except for the possibility of being released pursuant to a petition for habeas corpus. And we'll talk about, uh, that's a purely a constitutional argument uh, because Congress has dictated uh, that uh, many of these non-citizens uh, uh, are uh, to be, shall be detained. In other words, subject to mandatory detention. Rebecca or Jenny, you wanna add anything to that one? Nope. No. All right, so um, let's, uh, let's talk about the picture first. Um, you know, a picture is worth a thousand words and that's one of my clients there, Jose, uh, meeting his two children outside the Cambria County uh, prison in April this year uh, when he was released. And so, you know, when you're doing this work, I mean, there are many bad days because it's not easy to get somebody out of detention or win an asylum case. But uh, happily, even if numerically the good days, uh, the wins don't uh, exceed the losses, the good days make you very happy. And this was one where this guy's wife uh, texted me uh, this photograph and he was yet another person who had been in the wrong place at the wrong time. And uh, he lived in Erie and was, um, picked up by ICE one morning and uh, kind of carted off to the Erie uh, Border Patrol office and then ended up in Cambria prison. And unfortunately he had two DUIs and that's a big problem for getting release on bond. So initially he was denied release on bond, but I won't get into the whole story, but fortunately I managed to persuade ICE uh, to release him because his wife was pregnant and I was thinking, what, a, what an outrage it would be if this guy is languishing in the Cambria County prison uh, while he's got two beautiful kids like this that he can't look after and his wife is going to deliver their third kid. Uh, and, you know, he's in Cambria County prison. Anyway, that turned out okay. So um, uh, just looking at the basics of the slide here, I mean, I think many of you will know this, removal proceedings are initiated by a notice to appear. It's like the, the indictment, or if you like, the charge sheet. And um, uh, somebody, uh, you know, if, if you have determined that they're bond eligible, uh, they can uh, seek release on bond, and we'll talk about how to do that. Um, but you have a right to go to the immigration judge if you're bond eligible. And if the immigration judge turns you down, you do have a right to go to the BIA. Uh, I, I don't think that's a, really a very well used or very uh, profitable route because by the time you get to the BIA, 
Uh, the guy's been detained a long time and uh, winning in the BIA is, uh, is really a long shot. Um, just a note there that you've really only got one, one opportunity here for a bond hearing. Um, so you want to make sure that when you do apply for your client's release on bonds, you sort of keep, do the best you can the first time around, because you really don't get to have a second bite at the apple. And that Third Circuit case that we cite there uh, really sort of says that it, uh, if, if you don't like what happened at the bond hearing, you, you can't go and complain uh, to, a, to a federal judge. So uh, the bottom line really is that you've got to give it your very best shot uh, the first time around. Rebecca or Jenny, want to add to that? I would just add that um, you can move for a new bond hearing if you show change circumstances. Yeah. Um, so if some factual issue changes, uh, maybe the new baby is born um, or something that shows that you're not a, that the reason that the immigration judge thought you were dangerous before doesn't exist anymore, um, but, but it's limited in that way. Yeah. And I would just add, I, I actually wasn't aware of that third circuit case around uh, there being no due process right to an additional bond hearing, but that is an open question in many other circuits, including the ninth. So if there are any folks on who practice in other circuits, just something to keep in mind. And actually a great decision just came out this morning in the second circuit that I think directly contradicts Borbo in the third circuit and holds that once your detention becomes very prolonged, you should get a new bond hearing where the government bears the burden. Um, so interesting litigation developments in this area. Yeah. All right, I guess we're on to the next slide. Um, so what about a bond hearing? Um, it, it's fairly simple. Um, and um, I, I think the best practice, I mean, you can just make the request orally, uh, but uh, where you have uh, a client um, who's detained, uh, I think the best practice is to uh, file a written application uh, and to support it uh, with appropriate declarations uh, from uh, preferably family members. Um, so what you're gonna wanna do is address the two concerns that the judge will have. One is, is this guy or potentially woman uh, uh, a danger to the community? Uh, is he a flight risk? So danger to the community can be a problem if um, your client has criminal convictions. Uh, so you've really got to think about that and uh, explain them away as best you possibly can. And a problem that uh, I have seen quite frequently is that uh, people have DUIs and often that is what has led them to be detained by ICE. And immigration judges take, uh, at least in my experience, uh, take a very uh, dim or harsh view of DUI. Um, so while in our criminal system, uh, you generally are not gonna be imprisoned for DUI or refused bail, if you have, certainly if you have two DUIs, but possibly if you have only one, uh, immigration judges are gonna need a good amount of persuading that you're not a danger to the community. And to be honest, I mean, I, it's not like I'm a fan of DUI, but I was shocked at how uh, harsh the immigration judges' views are of, of DUI. So what can you do about it? Well, uh, you have to uh, you know, present evidence that uh, perhaps your client won't drive, that he's got other ways of getting around, uh, going to work, uh, that he's going to Alcoholics Anonymous, uh, that he's sort of addressing uh, the, the, the problem of, of the DUIs. So um, that's danger to the community. Flight risk, you're really going to address by showing the immigration judge uh, where your client would live. Uh, hopefully with some family members, hopefully uh, they have some uh, status in the country. Um, so you're gonna seek uh, declarations from a mother, a father, a girlfriend, 
uh, or, or the like, because you're going to have to show where they're going to live and that it's going to be a stable environment. Um, so that's the gist of it. The hearing itself, at least in my experience, is not involved oral testimony. You kind of stand up and the judge has got your papers. Uh, you make a short statement. The judge may have a couple of questions uh, the, of you. Uh, the judge may uh, ask the attorney for the government. Uh, what do you say about it? Um, and then the judge says, denied, you didn't meet your burden or well, I'm going to grant a bond and it's in the amount of X uh, and they're fairly steep amounts. Uh, again, in my experience, sort of, you know, $4,000 and up. Um, and I think it's a little beyond the scope of this now, but, um, you know, ability to pay is something of a hot issue because obviously if the bond set at $20,000, well, I mean, there's very few people uh, who are going to be able to come up with that money and you can't just you know, hand over an IOU, you've, you've got to have the money. Um, so another hot topic here mentioned in the slide is, well, who's got the burden? Basically, the BIA has said that the burden is on the um, non-citizen to show that he's not a flight risk or not a danger. Uh, and that's not written down anywhere other than, you know, in a BIA decision. But um, that's being chipped away at. Uh, that case, Borbo, that was on the prior slide, uh, pretty much holds that in the Third Circuit, um, there's no reason to put the burden on the government uh, at any stage. But elsewhere, I mean, outside of the Third Circuit, um, the, the law is, uh, should we say, changing, has changed. And, you know, just cited there one recent case from the District of Maryland, which reviews the law and explains why the burden uh, should be on the government. Um, so I'll uh, see if uh, Rebecca or Jenny would like to add to that. I don't Jenny? have any to add. Okay. okay. No, um, okay. So uh, Christopher, do you need to jump in for a sec or? Yeah, so the first secret word for the CLE credit is lighthouse. Again, it is lighthouse, as in you are all lighthouses for your clients. You okay. Say lighthouse. Okay, great. Um, so Tony was just discussing the process for people who are detained under 236A, uh, also known as 1226A. Um, that's the INA site and the federal uh code site. So those are people who are bond eligible at the outset of their detention and they get a chance to apply for a bond, albeit with that less favorable burden of proof, at least under current law in the Third Circuit. Um, there are many people who unfortunately are not able to apply for bond at all when they are first detained. Um, and Tony mentioned two categories, the arriving aliens is one, folks who are presenting themselves at the border, and then people who are detained under 1226C, 236C are the second. I'm gonna focus on 236C, but many of the constitutional issues that come up uh, could be, you could say the same for folks who are detained um, as arriving aliens. The case law isn't quite as developed, at least in the third circuit, but I think there's similar arguments to be made. Um, so people who are subject to 236C are deportable or inadmissible under certain criminal grounds. And, and that kind of ranges outside of what we're talking about today, but there's actually a list in the statute with a bunch of cross references. So if you're representing a client, you really need to kind of check the list and make sure um, that the grounds of deportability and inadmissibility match up. Um, and just because ICE is charging somebody with a ground of uh, inadmissibility or deportability that would trigger that mandatory detention provision doesn't mean that ICE is correct. Um, so you can at the outset, you know, you're going to, maybe that's your uh, defense to removal is to challenge those grounds of deportability and inadmissibility um, in terms of whether your client can be deported at all or not. 
You can also do that in the bond context. It's something called a matter of Joseph hearing where you say, ICE is not going to prove that my client is subject to mandatory detention at all. So that's why she should get a bond hearing now. But there will be situations where that's not the defense, that you're, you're applying for some other type of defense in removal proceedings and you don't have a good argument for why the person is not under the statute subject to mandatory detention. Um, or maybe you do have a good argument, but you lose that argument. And, and just you know, for those who are less familiar to make a note that these grounds of inadmissibility and deportability that are based on criminal convictions are extraordinarily broad. Um, they cover aggravated felonies, which is a list that goes from A to U of different types of crimes that make people deportable. They also cover, um, Tony mentioned, crimes involving moral turpitude, which is a big broad category that includes a lot of different things and controlled substance offenses. So that means that a lawful permanent resident who has lived here for years and years and years legally picks up one drug possession offense conviction and is not only subject to de deportation, but will be subject to mandatory detention during the course of removal proceedings while that person is litigating a challenge to their deportation. So the results of this, and it can happen at any time after that conviction. Um, so for example, you know, I had a client who was from Liberia, is from Liberia. She came here as a refugee um, when she was about uh, 10 years old back in the early 2000s. She grew up here. She was convicted of a crime that occurred just after her 19th birthday. Um, she served some time, she got out, she did probation. 10 years later, ICE came to her door and picked her up um, and she was detained for just over three years in ICE custody before she finally won her immigration case. Uh, and was determined not to be deportable at all. So that's the type of impact this provision has on folks, especially folks who are, I mean, to, to all kinds of people, but um, including people who are here lawfully. Um, but there are ways to challenge this type of detention, specifically um, constitutional challenges. Uh, so I'm just gonna give a brief history of a complex area of case law. Um, but since the statute was passed in 1996, there have been constitutional challenges to detention without a bond hearing um, under the due process clause, which of course requires procedures uh, before you are deprived, people are deprived of their liberty. Um, here, there are no procedures before someone is deprived of her liberty. Um, so, there was, the, there was a Supreme Court case back in 2003 called Demore versus Kim that upheld the statute against a facial challenge. So basically said, uh, in general, this is constitutional, um, which triggered then a wave of challenges to people who are detained for a very long time uh, under the statute. In Demore, the Supreme Court said, you know, for most people, this is only going to last about four to six months. That's about how long it takes to litigate a case. Turned out that was just not true. Um, but then they'll, you know, either be deported or they'll stay. And uh, it's, this isn't such a bad deprivation of liberty. Um, so then there have been challenges for people who have been detained much longer than that. Um, many courts adopted a the constitutional avoidance strategy where they said, we don't really think Congress meant that this could just go on forever. Uh, probably Congress thought that you could get a bond hearing if you were gonna be detained for a very long time. Um, in Jennings v. Rodriguez in 2018, the Supreme Court said, no, Congress didn't say anything about that. Congress meant for the duration of removal proceedings. So at this point, the challenges that are available are direct as applied constitutional challenges. Um, so the a petitioner files a habeas petition in federal court and says, I have been detained for a year, two years, whatever the case may be. And that means now the deprivation of liberty that I'm experiencing outweighs the government's reasons for detaining me without any kind of procedural protections. And I should get a bond hearing now. Um, 
And so Herman Santos versus Warden is the recent Third Circuit decision um, in that area, which basically reaffirms that this type of habeas petition is available after Jennings um, and holds that when a court, a federal court does determine that uh, your detention has become unconstitutionally prolonged, the government now has to bear the burden by clear and convincing evidence in the bond hearing that happens as a result of that habeas petition. So, you know, the obviously the enormous downside of this is that one, you have to sit in detention for probably at least six months. The, the timing, you know, I think around six months is a good time to file these types of petitions because they pend for a while. And for people who are pro se, it's an enormous lift to file a federal habeas petition in, um, in federal court. It's unfortunate that the circuits that had more bright line rules like the Ninth Circuit and the Second Circuit to allow this to happen kind of automatically the Supreme Court has pretty much foreclosed that, um, that option. But um, the good thing is that if you file this petition and are successful, then the government bears the burden of proof in that bond hearing, which gives people a better chance to actually get released. Um, and these petitions are for a pro se person, very difficult for a pro bono attorney, not that difficult. There are good samples out there. So we definitely encourage anyone, anyone um, who hasn't done this before to get involved. That was a great summary of about 17 or so years of litigation. Um, thanks for that. We're gonna transition over to post final order detention. And so this is the statute that governs people who have a final order, but they're still in detention. And you might be wondering if someone has a removal order, why are they still being detained? There are basically two categories of people in the situation and they're not mutually exclusive, but just kind of in broad strokes, we have people who are still contesting their removal in some way, despite having a final order. And then we have people who are simply sitting in detention because ICE has not been able to remove them. And I wanted to focus on that second group because I think in a lot of ways they're forgotten and are even less likely to have lawyers. But just to touch on the first group briefly, um, there are a number of situations where someone might have an order that's final at the BIA, but they're still fighting removal. And a common example is people who were previously deported came back to the US, they've been found to have a reasonable fear that they might be persecuted or tortured. And in that situation, they're allowed to apply for protection with the immigration courts. Um, there is a circuit split about whether these people are covered by the pre-order or post-order detention statute, but at least um, in the third and the ninth circuits, they are considered to be detained under 1231 and actually have the right to a bond hearing after being detained for six months. Uh, but that, as far as I know, that's the rule only in the third and the ninth circuits. So hooray for those of us who are lucky enough to, to be there. Uh, but in the rest of the country, because the regulations provide that people who have a final order are not bond eligible, you wouldn't be able to just uh, get that bond hearing set. You would have to go to federal court and file an individual habeas petition. So turning to the people who are not actively fighting removal, but they're just in there because ICE is running into practical problems with being able to remove them. As a bit of background, as a general matter for ICE to be able to deport someone, the person needs to have a travel document. And that could be either a passport or some other document issued by the receiving country that allows them to actually board a flight and to be admitted into that country. And as you might imagine for someone who is a refugee and fled their country of origin, they probably, they may never have had any identity documents issued by that country. And it becomes just practically speaking, very difficult for ICE to convince that country to take the person back. So, um, you know, there are a lot of countries around the world. I would say they tend to be countries that don't have great diplomatic relations with the US, may have been previously invaded by the US or you know, there's legacies of conflict there. Um, they often delay in issuing travel documents or in some cases just refuse altogether. 
ICE has um, a nice term for this. They call these countries recalcitrant countries. And that is a list that is constantly shifting, but I pulled one from 2019 and some of the countries on there are Cuba, Iran, China, Laos, Vietnam, and Cambodia. Um, I included this picture here of Kim Ho Ma. He's one of the two petitioners who was, their cases were consolidated in the Zibidis case before the Supreme Court. Um, I just think it's interesting sometimes to hear the stories of people who are behind these major decisions. Mr. Ma was a refugee. He was born during the genocide in Cambodia, lived in the US since he was a young child. Um, he grew up in public housing projects in Seattle and got involved in a gang as a teenager. He went to prison in the late 90s and after that he was turned over to immigration custody. But at the time, Cambodia had no repatriation agreement with the US wasn't taking anybody back. And he actually spent three years in ICE custody with a final order, which is longer than he spent in criminal custody. And um, I learned at some point, there were a lot of people in a situation and there was a term for them. They were called lifers because you know, at that time they essentially faced the prospect of being detained forever in ICE custody. Fortunately, the Supreme Court in Mr. Ma's case um, actually the Ninth Circuit in his case, and then ultimately the Supreme Court held that there is a due process problem with a statute that would allow for a definite detention. And the court interpreted this statute to have an implicit limitation. Um, there's kind of a rule of thumb set forth in Zibidis, which is that six months is a presumptively reasonable amount of time for ICE to try to effectuate somebody's removal. That doesn't mean that somebody automatically gets released after six months. There is a burden shifting framework where after six months, the non-citizen has to come forward with some good reason to believe that their removal is not what's called reasonably foreseeable. And if they can make that initial showing, then the burden shifts to ICE to come back and rebut that. So, you know, this is despite being a really important landmark case that I think is the foundation for a lot of the subsequent case law around immigration detention, I would say that the practical reality is that implementation has been uneven at best. And I think this is for a lot of the reasons that Rebecca was talking about, just whenever you require somebody who's locked up in immigration detention to go into federal court and file a habeas petition, that's just an, an enormous barrier that a lot of people will not be able to overcome. Uh, in cases where people are able to file pro se, it's pretty easy for ICE to come back with a hearsay declaration from a deportation officer claiming that you know, travel documents are forthcoming. Um, and judges, unfortunately, have been somewhat deferential to those types of claims. And then you know, the other practical aspect of this is in cases where ICE is pretty sure they're gonna lose, um, what they generally do is that they release the person and then they move to dismiss the habeas as moot. And you know, as a result, the person achieves the outcome that they wanted at least for now, but there just aren't a ton of favorable decisions on Zibidis issues. So um, you know, I think it's an area where it's, it's ripe for litigation. I don't think it's terribly hard to um, get one of these together. There are samples out there um, and, you know, you could really assist someone in, you know, being able to get out of detention much, much faster than they otherwise would. Um, so just to return to Mr. Ma's case briefly, as just the postscript to his case is uh, that, you know, shortly after this would be this decision, I think about a year later, Cambodia started accepting small numbers of deportees for the first time. And Mr. Ma ended up being one of the first people to be deported there. Um, there's, there's a documentary about him and some other folks called Sentenced Home, if you're, if you're curious. Um, it's still just an important decision because it establishes this bedrock principle that immigration attention does have to be related to its purpose, which is to carry out removal. And there are due process limitations. And you'll see this case cited in other decisions challenging detention in all sorts of contexts. So um, I wanted to talk a little bit about what happens after somebody gets released under Zibidis. So they end up on something called an order of supervision, which is akin to being on probation or parole. They need to report to ICE regularly. They are able to apply for a work authorization so they can work legally in the US. 
And as of 2014, there were over 600,000 non-citizens in the US living on orders of supervision. I would say that these folks inhabit somewhat of a legal gray area where you know, they've been ordered removed, but they're essentially allowed to live and work in the US with the government's full knowledge. Um, and despite all of that, there isn't a whole lot of case law that speaks to what protections they have against being re-detained by ICE. So I included this uh, screenshot of the January 2017 executive order. It was one of Trump's first moves after taking office. And I think this executive order got more attention for the uh, enforcement priorities aspect where they, it essentially made everybody an enforcement priority for deportation, but buried in there, there is also a provision specifically targeting recalcitrant countries. And it directed the Department of Homeland Security and the State Department to work together to implement sanctions on foreign countries that are considered to be non-cooperative with the US in accepting people. Soon after that, we started seeing raids on people from diverse communities, um, to name a few, Iraqi, Somali, and Cambodian immigrants were all swept up in mass raids beginning in 2017. And these are folks who had, they had been permitted to live and work in the US and raise a family here. And you know, one day they just had ICE show up at their door or they went to their regular check-in and were arrested and they were threatened with being immediately deported. One of the Cambodians who was picked up uh, was our client, Ricky Chun. And his story actually parallels Kim Ho Ma's in a lot of ways. He was a Cambodian refugee, lived here since he was a kid, went to prison in the late 90s. And uh, it was a few years after Kim Ho Ma's case and he was actually able to take advantage of the Zedvitas decision and get out. The difference was that Ricky was never deported. He went back to his community, he was living on an order of supervision for decades, never arrested again. He's part of a close-knit family, was taking care of his mom, working as a technician for AT&T. And then one day he went in for what he thought was gonna be his regular annual check-in with ICE and they arrested him. They put him on a plane um, across the country, away from his family, away from any potential counsel, and he was about to be deported to Cambodia. Um, he's still here because he became the lead plaintiff in a class action lawsuit, um, and he's, he's been able to stay here while he challenges his removal. So just to speak briefly, um, I know we're running a little bit short on time, but in terms of the remedies available to people in Ricky's situation, there's a set of remedies through the immigration court system, and then you can go into federal court in some situations. So through the immigration court system, you can file what is known as a motion to reopen. This is essentially a collateral attack on your removal order based on sort of changed circumstances or new evidence. And some of the common grounds are that country conditions have changed such that you would be in fear for your life. Or um, another common example is that the law has changed and now the conviction that was the basis for your removal is no longer considered a deportable offense. Um, in most cases, filing the motion to reopen on its own does not automatically stay the person's removal. They would also need to file a stay motion. And just to back up for a second, from a practical perspective, it's extremely difficult for someone who's just been picked up in a raid to file a motion to reopen. And you know, all of the barriers to access to counsel that exist for anyone in ICE custody apply here, but also you're dealing with proceedings that are years or potentially decades old. And if you don't happen to have copies of your immigration court files you know, on your person when you're picked up or sitting in your house somewhere, you might have to file a FOIA request, which could take months to process. And you know, by that time you've already been deported. So you know, because of these types of problems, um, in some cases, advocates have been successful in going into federal court to seek a stay of removal from a district judge. Uh, folks might be aware that, you know, as a general matter, the immigration laws have stripped the federal courts of jurisdiction over these types of claims. Um, but there's sort of these really narrow arguments where you can argue that the manner in which ICE is deporting someone violates due process and makes it effectively impossible for them to assert their rights through the administrative process. And you know, 
we've, I don't know if this is just like a Ninth Circuit thing, but um, at least out here, it remains possible to bring these types of challenges. There was a similar case brought uh, for Iraqis and it was unfortunately eventually reversed by the Sixth Circuit. Um, and then in Ricky's case, we were able to get class-wide relief requiring that ICE actually give people advance notice uh, before they pick the person up, which makes sense if the person has been reporting and complying all these years with their order of supervision. Um, so I think that is about the end of my time. Um, I know that was a lot of information, but I think the takeaway is just that you know, due process applies to everyone, including people who have final orders. You can challenge your detention under Zedvitas, and then for people who were released and now they're being picked up again, there's another set of creative challenges that can be brought potentially in federal court. Thank you, Jenny. I'm just gonna go ahead and, and announce the second CLE credit uh, word, secret word. It is key card, as in there's no single key card that we can use in the system. Again, it's key card. All right, thanks, Christopher. And thanks to all the panelists, this was great. Um, as you can see, there are a lot of costs and burdens associated with detention. Immigrants are separated from their family. I think that uh, the photo that Tony shared with us was really helpful to help us realize that it's not just one person who's in detention, but there's impact on the rest of the family. There's also costs associated with being able to effectively work with a lawyer. It's so, so much harder when people are in detention to be able to um, effectively work with a lawyer and for lawyers to be able to, um, you know, to, to, to work effectively with their clients as well. There's also the medical impact, the mental health impact. There's so many things that um, the costs associated with detention. So it was really great to hear about the work that can be done and the work that is being done. And I guess one thing I just want to, uh, I want to encourage people to ask questions in the chat, um, in the Q&A, excuse me. But I'd also like to, um, to think about what can people do, people who are in the audience, how can they get involved in this work? So that's for the panelists. So Tony, for example, how did you get involved? Okay. Um, we uh, at our firm now, Troutman Pepper, um, sort of formed a relationship, if you like, with PERC, Pennsylvania Immigrants Resource Center. So they're out in New York. And we talked to them about what their needs were for representation. And they said bond hearings uh, at that point, which might have been a couple of years ago or so, there were 100 people, um, immigrant detainees, come into the York prison every week. And I think Perk, uh, Ryan Brunswick was the guy there, uh, conducted some kind of a screening seminar explaining to uh, detainees uh, you know, how this all works. And they would interview each person and those that look like they had a shot at, at a release on bond, uh, they referred to us. And if we had lawyers that were willing to take it on, uh, we did that. So that there, there are fewer people at York these days, but essentially that's how we uh, at our firm got started, uh, namely working with Perk. Uh, we have had uh, the pleasure of working with Rebecca and Vanessa Stein at the ACLU and uh, I.O. at, at, at highest, uh, less so on bond cases, but um, anyway, that's how we got our start. Yeah, so that's great. So Ryan is actually on the call. Okay, and, hi Ryan. And, um, <laughs> yeah, and it's great for firms to be able to create these kind of relationships. So one way for those of you who are at firms to be involved is to um, connect with organizations like PERC like uh, Rebecca's organization, ACLU, et cetera, and, um, and then you know, collaborate um, and start to create a community within the firm of people who do this work so that they can support each other. So Rebecca, what are some other ways that people can get involved? 
Yeah, I, I think I would just add, um, I absolutely agree that it, for us, it's so helpful when a firm is able to build some internal expertise um, so that we don't need, you know, we mentor a lot the first time and then they can kind of really run with it. That's been the case with Pepper and with Tony's team. Um, and I'll just note that we have, we now have a very baby uh, pilot project in Pennsylvania called the Pennsylvania Immigrant Family Unity Project, PIFUP, P-A-I-F-U-P, um, kind of a long acronym, but that is a pilot program to provide universal representation to detained immigrants in their removal proceedings. Um, so in, the, in an ideal world, it would look like a public defender model because I don't think we mentioned this expressly, but it was sort of weaving through everything we said that people, in, immigrants in detention do not have a right to counsel. They do not get appointed counsel. So this program, we're not close to representing everybody, but we take people on a merits blind basis and try to um, model what a public defender program would look like. So we can use your support talking to elected officials in your area. It's funded currently by the city of Philadelphia, but we need a lot more government support, especially from across the Commonwealth to make um, it accessible to all people from Pennsylvania. But also um, the program only funds like the sort of core deportation defense work. So like, it doesn't fund habeas petitions or federal court appeals. So we've been working with Tony's team to take up those habeas petitions as a pro bono matter that come out of that program. Um, so if there are other folks who are interested in doing that, feel free to reach out to me about that. Yeah, so it sounds like Tony's uh, work is a really great example for how people, lawyers can get involved and do encore work that really is meaningful and purposeful and also bring along junior associates along the way to start doing this work as well. So we have a question from Chris, Christine Marcosi, one of my, um, uh, one of the CARES alums, the STAR CARES alums, and I see that there are a lot of them on the call today. So she wants to know, has, has anyone been successful in legal challenges to conditions of detention for those who are detained? So are there class action suits that are dealing with conditions of detention? Yes, uh, especially during COVID, that has been a rising area. Um, uh, Vanessa from the ACLU is the person to talk to about that. Um, there was a class action here in Pennsylvania called Thacker versus Dahl, um, which was initially successful and has been less successful in getting class-wide uh, relief. Um, and there's a pending petition for rehearing, I believe, in a case called Hope in the Third Circuit, which um, also raises conditions of confinement issues. And Jenny, you can speak about maybe some other places around the country. Yeah, so I, I think the COVID-related litigation has seen mixed success around the country. Almost, I think almost all of the facilities in California ha are the subjects of class action lawsuits, and many have uh, been ordered to significantly reduce their populations. Um, so I think one question for advocates is how do we how do we maintain this momentum past COVID? What happens when the pandemic subsides? Do people just get taken back into detention? Are there more long term ways that we can challenge detention? Um, there's also been some litigation around conditions of confinement that specifically impact access to counsel. Uh, so there have been some lawsuits in California around phone access, access to attorneys for people in detention um, that have resulted in settlements. So I know it's close to 12, I mean to one, and we're supposed to wrap up. I have two more questions that are in the queue that I just want to, I'm going to throw out both of them. And if anyone's willing to take them on, that would be great. One is, um, can you discuss how to help arriving alien asylum seekers to obtain parole? That's from my colleague, Hiro Hiro um, Hiroko um, from Louisiana. And can ICE transport an individual from a circuit more favorable to an individual? So, so can ICE transport someone from one jurisdiction, from one circuit to another jurisdiction, to another circuit, um, based on the, um, the, the, the law in those two circuits. Tony, you're an expert on both these issues. Uh, 
Um, well, I do have a, an arriving alien habeas petition in uh, Louisiana at the moment. Um, um, so where I was successful in front of the magistrate judge, it's currently being uh, appealed, if you like, or the, the, the government has subjected to the magistrate's report. Uh, so it's in front of the judge in the Western District of Louisiana. That is where we uh, try to establish uh, a right uh, to have a bond hearing for somebody, an arriving alien who's been detained now uh, a year while his case uh, meanders. Uh, it's now in the Board of, uh, Board of Immigration Appeals. Um, so, uh, and I guess I'll say that uh, there are a number of other district courts that have agreed that arriving aliens uh, should be allowed to uh, seek a habeas petition when their detention has become unduly prolonged. And we, you know, the, the Santos case that Rebecca talked about is kind of one of the best cases out there, albeit that that's not actually an arriving alien, but the same principle supplies, as, as Rebecca said. As for, I think the question began with what about persuading ICE on parole? Um, uh, <laughs> In Louisiana, at any rate, uh, that appears to be an enormous problem. And there is a case in the District of Columbia uh, against ICE. I believe the plaintiff's name is Mons, M-O-N-S. And uh, there's a, um, how to say it, there used to be a, or there was a policy directive at ICE uh, setting forth when they should or would release somebody, an arriving alien. And uh, when that was properly being followed, um, I don't know, it's a significant percentage, maybe 50% or something like that of arriving aliens were in fact released. But the uh, New Orleans office of ICE basically stopped following it. And so about 99% of people were just kept in detention and ICE seemed to throw any parole request in the trash, which ticked off the district judge in um, the District of Columbia. So the last thing I read there is that he ordered some discovery of the ICE field office in New Orleans uh, to find out, you know, basically why they weren't following the law. And I guess to answer the other question very quickly, ICE can transfer people. Um, if you have filed a habeas petition already, then there's a very strong argument that the judge that had the jurisdiction over the habeas petition keeps the jurisdiction, even if ICE moves the person. But if they move the person before you file the habeas petition, then you're probably stuck filing in the place where they are now detained. Yeah, it's, okay. it's certainly my impression that there's probably not a constitutional challenge to uh, moving somebody from, say, Pennsylvania to Texas. I mean, we've certainly got clients who sort of uh, that, that home is in Pennsylvania, but the next thing you know, ISIS moved them to someplace in Texas or elsewhere. Uh, the one area where I know that, uh, well, not we, but I, I've seen other lawyers got a little bit of traction was certainly on the migrant protection protocols to argue that if you uh, if you if you form a, an attorney client relationship with an asylum seeker in the United States but then they are sent back to wait a border town in Mexico uh, that that infringes their rights to a, a you know an existing relationship with counsel so I mean that's a complex area but I'm just mentioning that that it did get some acceptance by at least one federal judge. Thanks, Tony. Uh, to close out, just want to say thank you everyone for joining our panel today. Professor Pristone for your wonderful, wonderful facilitation and willingness to moderate. It's always appreciated. Thank you, Jenny, Rebecca, and Anthony for taking the time to share your expertise and insights with us over the past few months. Uh, it's been invaluable. Thank you, Sarah, for sharing your incredible talent by creating the incredibly detailed sketch of today's panel. Uh, we'll email the sketch note graphic to all the participants, uh, and we'll also include the link to the website that has the additional resources and articles that we mentioned earlier on. The CLE credit quizzes should be in your inbox already, uh, but please feel free to join us for our next and final panel discussing ICE surveillance, 
of a Philadelphia pastor uh, for her work with immigration uh, com immigrant communities next Monday. Uh, and thank you and all have a, have a wonderful week.